So I want to introduce uh, Professor Michael Goodchild. Uh, he is the Jack and Laura Dangerman Professor of Geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Director of UCSB's Center for Spatial Studies. He received his BA degree from Cambridge University in Physics in 1965 and his PhD from McMaster University in 1969 and has received four honorary doctorates. He was elected member of the National Academy of Science and foreign member of the Royal Society of Canada. And uh, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I need to. <laughs> um, and uh, he's a corresponding fellow of the British Academy and editor of uh, Geographic Analysis. So with that, let me introduce Dr. Goodchild. Thank you so much for that introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to do this. It's a great honor to be asked to do this on the 50th anniversary meeting. Um, I, uh, I should explain the title. I actually retired uh, on June 30th. Um, I'm still... <clears throat> I'm still struggling with what retirement means. Um, I reckon, I, I counted that by the middle of September, after two and a half months of retirement, I'd spent precisely 23 nights in my own bed. Um, so I have decided that I have to be more serious about retirement and really get my head around it. Um, but one of the things I'm planning to do, we're moving to Seattle um, later this week. Um, we have built a house in Seattle. And one of the things I'm hoping to do is to get into gardening in a serious way. And so this title, which I chose because in many ways it summarizes what I've been doing for the last 40 years, um, also has a new interpretation, which is what gets under your fingernails when you're digging in the garden, otherwise known as digital earth. <laughs> so uh, what I'd like to do today is to talk with the starting point of Al Gore's speech, uh, January 1998, uh, for the opening of the California Science Center on January 31st. And it was a speech which, at the time, received quite a lot of attention and I think was extraordinarily visionary. Um, he talks about a virtual reality in which a child will be able to go to a museum, put on a head display, and zoom around the world, and zoom down to um, meter scale resolution. Um, she'd be able to layer other kinds of information on top of that uh, basic layer. And she'd be able to go forward in time and backward in time. And this, I think, was extraordinarily visionary because in January of 1998, that was a full seven years before Google came out with Google Earth. And we started to see what Al was talking about. And I think, therefore, it's useful to go back to that point as a very visionary um, speculation. 14 years ago, and try to update what we might say today about the future. How would we speculate about the future of what we do, of ge uh, geospatial technologies, in 2012? So here's a timeline of what happened after the speech. Um, the uh, speech was January 1998. 1999, an a, uh, interagency digital Earth working group was established by NASA in the federal government. And it started to stimulate the production of some digital Earth prototypes, one of which was developed by a company called Keyhole, called Earth Viewer. It later became Google Earth when Google bought Keyhole. November 1999, first international symposium on digital Earth in Beijing. And then there's a gap. And of course, the gap is the 2000 election. And after that election, anything associated with Gore was off the table in Washington. As a result, however, uh, early 2005, Google released the Google Earth client. And later in 2005, <clears throat> the Google Earth application programming interface. And Microsoft came out with a very similar thing, which it had originally called Virtual Earth. And the rest is history, of course. So 
What we were looking at then was, and still are, was a client-server architecture. And it's important, I think, to just get below the hood to understand what this really meant and what it might mean for the future. Because the data volumes are absolutely massive. If you represent the Earth at one meter resolution, you have five times 10 to the 14th elements to deal with. So if you just give one byte to each square meter, that's nearly a petabyte of inference nearly a petabyte of information right there. You have to somehow to ship this from the, from the client to the server. And any kind of rendering that you want to do on the client, if it's a fairly thin client, just a simple laptop, is going to be problematic. Uh, refreshing the server at video, refreshing from the server at video rates is going to become problematic. So it's important, I think, to recognize the solution that Keyhole came up with and that Google Earth uh, came up with, which was to pre-compute on the server tiles in raster form, which could be sent very quickly to the client when needed. And that's the solution that Google Maps uses, Google Earth uses, and virtually everybody uses, and Apple's new, new Maps software also uses. And the, then when the tiles come to the server, come to the client, they're rapidly warped to fit the current view on the client. So here's, I, I can't show you Google Earth's internal grid because it's never been exposed. But here's some examples of the kinds of global grids that people have worked with. Here's one based on the icosahedron, 20 triangles. And if you cut away those triangles, you actually get a soccer ball. And what you've got is, is a system for hierarchically decomposing the triangles into four, and then fitting, as you get finer and finer resolution, fitting to the Earth. And here's the scheme that Google, uh, GeoFusion uses, which is actually the, the scheme underlying our scene, uh, our globe, the, uh, the Esri version of this. So what made all this possible? One thing that made it possible was abundant supplies of Earth data, especially fine resolution remote sensing to form the base layer. And of course, that's what all these technologies use. Fast internet access. We got to the point where most people had a broadband connection, and so it became possible to do this. Fast graphics accelerators, and I think this one is probably the most significant of all, because because of the video game industry, by 2000, the average PC had a graphics accelerator which could do this kind of stuff. And it was the fact that they were basically in every PC by 2000, which enabled Google Earth really to take off. And the published APIs, which allowed third parties to get into the game, build applications, build apps, and integrate data. Okay. However, and there's a, a big however here, because what was done then and what we still have today is by no means perfect. Go to Google Earth and generate a uh, triangle. Is that, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can see the cursor here and I can't see it on the screen. Generate a triangle by connecting, let's say, a point around San Francisco with a point up on um, uh, Spitsbergen and then down to the middle Atlantic. Right? And what you would expect to see is three arcs of great circles. This is what you actually get in Google Earth. And what it demonstrates is that Google Earth, in fact, still thinks the Earth is flat. <laughs> <clears throat> and underneath this, this image, which is warped onto the Earth, underneath this image is a flat Earth. And that triangle has been sketched on a flat Earth and then warped back onto the sphere. So very far from perfect. And just while we're on this, here's another example. Um, it's amazing how endemic this sort of thing is. Here's a NOAA site, a website, which uses the um, Web Mercator projection to display, in this case, North America. And I'll expand what it shows you in terms of the position of the cursor. Right. Position of the cursor resolved to four decimal places of latitude. I imagine many people in this room can convert that to 10 meters, right? The fourth decimal place is worth 10 meters. That cursor, which is the size of a fist, superimposed on Ar Arkansas, it's actually telling me where that cursor is to 10 meters of accuracy, which is, of course, absurd. Three of those decimal places are pure junk. Right? But it gets worse because look at the scale. Scale of 1 to 36 million, right? Every inch on the map is worth 36 million inches on the Earth. But wait a minute, I'm seeing it here at one scale, you're seeing it here at a different scale. That scale can't be true of both. 
And what's more, it's actually true of neither, because whoever designed the website didn't know the size of my screen. Right? And this is a web Mercator projection, and on any flattened Earth, it is impossible for scale to be constant, because the Earth has been distorted. So that scale is true, in fact, one place on the Earth only, and that's on the equator. And the equator is not actually visible on this map. So these are the kinds of problems people get into when they start messing with geographic data. And just one last one. Um, here's AGIS, to remain nameless. And <laughs> in, uh, when I was attending a conference in uh, Wellington, New Zealand, I flew there from Beijing. And so I thought it'd be cool to find out how far I'd flown, to find out how many miles I'd be credited with in my account. And so I positioned the cursor ba vaguely over Beijing, positioned it vaguely over Wellington, New Zealand, and asked for the distance. And you can see that that line is curved, as it should be, because it's a geodesic over the curved Earth. And it gives me the distance to 14 digits, right? resolved to a micron of meters, 10 to the minus 6, a millionth of a meter. <laughs> Imagine driving up I-5 towards Seattle and seeing a road sign which gave you the distance to Seattle resolved to a millionth of a meter. <laughs> You'd think that was the biggest joke since sliced bread or whatever, right? Only three at best of those digits are actually meaningful. So my point is simply that the technology that we have in these digital Earths is, is very far from perfect. And there is, even at the technical level, room for very substantial improvement. But let's focus on the positives. And of course, there are many positives having to do with Google Earth. Um, the speed. It's possible to spin the Earth on the screen. Video refresh rates. Powerful graphics. Even operating on a thin client. It's possible to do some things in 3D. So we have examples like uh, Esri's uh, urban uh, city engine. Many other technologies which will have 3D displays. It doesn't, however, deal with the solid Earth, and I'll come to that in a minute, or with the atmosphere. And it's very user-centric. It's easy to generate mashups in Google Earth and Google Maps. It's easy to generate uh, your own applications. One aspect, though, that I think is still very much a research issue, which is how to represent the Earth as a solid. And there's been some very interesting work recently. So we're used to a two-dimensional representation. Google SketchUp can be integrated with Google Earth. You can do some things in 3D. But three-dimensional Earth where it's possible to represent the entire planet, its groundwater, its atmospheric pollution, all the way to the center of the Earth, is still very much a research topic. And here's some very, what I think is very interesting research coming out of uh, China, out of Beijing Normal University, Professor Wu, who's developed a th true three-dimensional grid. Instead of a grid overlaid on the surface of the Earth, this goes all the way to the core. I think we're about to see some very interesting applications of this kind of, kind of tool. So where are the significant gaps? And I've said that basically we're dealing only with models of the surface of the Earth. If our aim as a community is literally to build a digital replica of the planet and everything going on on the planet, we've made a lot of progress, but only with respect to the surface. I've just illustrated some ways in which we still haven't quite come to grips with the scientific aspects of this, with things like scale and map projections are still um, pretty challenging for many applications. And imagine if you had actual access to the grid. Then you would be able to use the grid to simulate processes on the Earth's surface. This is something that people are doing, for example, with NASA's WorldWind, which is one version of digital Earth working with a digital Earth in order to simulate the future. And that's something that is in the Gore speech, but is not something that we really have been able to get much progress on or much traction on over the last, uh, last decade. So that's an area, I think, where we really need to be heading. And also, these are not engines for downloading data. They should be, ideally, a digital Earth, and Gore talks about this, would be capable of downloading data to your own laptop. This is generally not true. I mean, people have, have reverse engineered so that you can extract the data from Google Earth, but it's still not something that certainly is within the, uh, the terms of use of, of Google Earth. So here's um, a couple of slides from a presentation I made to Congress 
1998, shortly after the Gore speech, when we were trying to interest Congress in following up on the Gore speech. And one of the things we talked about, and, and notice here that it involves going to the library. These days you would go to your basement or go to your, your desk. Uh, going to the library, drilling down, accessing information about a place, about a location. Tell me everything you know about that location. We talked about how this would be something that a child at school might want to do, or somebody at, at City Hall might want to do. So I said in 1998 that I thought by the year 2005, it should be possible to assemble all relevant information about the resource, based on the resources of the, the internet about a known location. Tell me everything you've got about this location. It's possible for a child to learn about the Earth and its infinite variety through digital technology. That's a vision, I think, that we've fallen desperately short on. We've always advocated that GIS is a technology for integrating layers of data. But when you think about it and actually try to do it, it's still remarkably difficult. It's remarkably hard to assemble all the information available about one location. We're very good at grabbing layers of data, right? one thing about many places, but we're not very good at integrating data vertically, many things about one place. In fact, there's, there's quite an old technology now that was developed by a guy called Dan Dave Gustafson at Montana State University. He was a graduate student, and he called it the graphical locator. And it allows you to bring up a map of the US, to zoom to Southern California, to zoom to Santa Barbara, and then to point to a location on the map and say, tell me everything about that point. Imagine trying to do this with today's GIS technology. And here's the answer you get. That location is latitude, longitude, slope, elevation, gradient, everything that's known about that location in the context of the layers of information in the graphical locator. What he didn't have, of course, was access to the web when this was done. This was done many years ago. It wasn't possible to crawl the web, but imagine taking this today and integrating all the resources of the web around this simple query. Tell me everything you've got about that location. So back to Digital Earth, and what is Digital Earth really trying to do? So we've got the Gore speech. The Gore speech actually has, has um, there were several um, precursors. Uh, Al Gore in his book, Earth and the Balance in 1992 actually talks about a digital earth talks about it as a mechanism for disseminating data. And if you're into science fiction, you may know Neil Stevenson's novel, Snow Crash, which talks about a digital replica of the planet, a mirror world. And so there are some precursors. But if you go to the speech and ask, what is Digital Earth for? Gore talks mostly about a young child. But I think we generalize that to say, someone needing geospatial data, a researcher, an educator, a student, a stakeholder, a citizen interested in the planet and its future, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes, a real estate developer, because it turns out that Earth View, uh, that Keyhole, when it was trying to market Earth Viewer, thought of real estate development as the major application of their technology. And you will also hear, and uh, Michael Jones, who, who is one of the developers of, of uh, Google Earth, is uh, often says this, we built it because we could. A classic build and they will come kind of reaction. It seemed a good thing to do, and so we built it. Which is wonderful from a research perspective. I, think, I, I wish I could say that more often. Uh, but it's uh, certainly something you will hear in, in the industry. So what should Google Earth do? And one of the things that was never clearly identified was the use cases of digital Earth. What would you use it for if it existed? The magic carpet ride, which Gore talks about. A method of publication. Many people use Google Earth nowadays for publishing scientific results. Should it copy GIS functionality? Do you want Google Earth to have all the functions of a GIS? And typically the answer is no, because what you're dealing with is something more visual, more intuitive, more subjective, less industrial strength than your typical GIS. Something that can be used to search for anomalies, search for patterns, search for similarities. And of course, many people have used Google Earth for precisely that over the years. A source of data, 
a mechanism for searching for data by spinning the Earth and saying, what information is available for various points on the Earth's surface? Yes, something we certainly we'd want it to do. Data access, however, is not something that the current generation can deal with particularly well. And to me, I think the number one desiderata of a next generation of digital Earth would be the ability to simulate social and environmental processes. To know how the Earth works enough to be able to take the Earth at time t and simulate what it will look like at time t plus one. To take Portland in the year 2012 and simulate what Portland might look like in the year 2020. That kind of simulation, I think, is ultimately the most valuable thing we can get from a digital Earth. So a digital Earth has a simulation engine, a platform for transforming the world, for visualizing Earth's future in an accessible package that a child of 10 can use. And also being able to go back in time and see what the Earth used to look like. If you think about that for a minute, what the Earth used to look like is something that we in this community ought to be very good at. But I like to imagine coming back, and we heard 2037 earlier, so let's use 2037. Imagine you came back in 2037 and you asked, how did the world used to look in the past? And perhaps you said, how did the world used to look in 2012? And so you get very busy, you try to access all the data, all the geospatial data from 2012. But that's 25 years ahead. And right now, we have no technology for preserving digital data for 25 years. In reality, I think you would have an enormous difficulty doing that. And if you said instead, what did the world look like in 1960, you'd actually be better off, because you would still have the paper maps that we generated in 1960. The digital world is really creating a problem for us because we have no effective way of archiving what we're creating. We're creating at an enormous rate, and yet none of our technologies, none of our media are capable of preserving in the decadal time frame. So in terms of broad success, I think the most important success of, Google, of uh, Digital Earth has been this. It's been the engagement of the citizen. It's been a technology that a child of 10 can make effective use of in 10 minutes. And in 2005, when Google Earth came out, this was a huge shock to me because I'd been teaching students for a decade or more, and I'd been running them through three courses, a sequence of courses in GIS, and it was really hard for them. They did a huge amount of work, and we got to the end of the year, and I wanted to give them a treat, you know, something that they could really value for all the struggles they'd been through using the technology. And the treat that I gave them was a flyby. Use your GIS knowledge to generate a video flyby of Santa Barbara. And they would love it. They'd get so excited. This was tremendous. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I've taken this GIS sequence of courses and I can generate a video flyby. They showed it to all their friends. They showed it to their family, their moms and dads. Oh my god, you know, it's really great what you did in this GIS course. March of 2005, Google Earth came out, and a child of 10 could do that in 10 minutes. <laughs> so it really caused us a lot of angst. What were we doing? Why were we putting people through this elaborate training program when the result was something that a child of 10 could now do in 10 minutes? Of course, that led to all sorts of, of rethinking, uh, greater emphasis on concepts, on what I called critical spatial thinking. But that really, I think, was the most significant uh, event, the most significant development of, of Google Earth. It made the citizen both a producer and a consumer. We're now into the arena of crowdsourcing, neo-geography. I'm reminded of Don Cook's comment that uh, neo-geography is very scary because it makes people like me and him paleo-geographers. Google Earth is really a communication medium. It's GIS as media. It's a method of presenting the results of good science to the citizen, not to the shelves of a library. It allows us to extend the full cycle of Earth data, all the way from NASA taking images of Earth, all the way through to scientific results for the citizen, and to deal with past, present, and future. And I think this is where 
the real vision for the future has to lie. There been a number of impacts of this whole neo-geography thing because essentially it initially presented an alternative means of producing geographic information, an alternative to traditional, expensive, largely government-based production of geographic information. And I coined the term volunteered geographic information because I thought that represented what was really going on. I think that this is something profoundly different for this field because it forces us to ask the question, what happens when you put users in the driver's seat? When you make it possible for anyone to make a map of anything, what will they choose to make maps of? And you make it possible for them to do that at no cost. Today, anyone can make a map of anything. So what do people choose to map? And the answer is clearly not the traditional things that we've mapped as a society. And it's something very different. Here's an example from Google Maps. This is what you would get today if you went to Google Maps and asked for a map of the Himalayan region. And you notice that many of the lines are dashed because many of the borders in this area are disputed. Around Arunachal Pradesh in the bottom right or around Kashmir in the top left. That's the view you would get. If, on the other hand, you accessed Google Maps from India, from an Indian IP address, your request would be diverted to an Indian server, and this is the map you would get. Because this map represents official Indian policy. Indian policy is that all of Kashmir belongs to India, Arunachal Pradesh belongs to India, and there's no dispute about it. And if you did the same thing from the People's Republic of China, not including Hong Kong, that's what you would get. Uh, the borders of China are absolutely beyond dispute, and Renochel Pradesh is part of China. So you've got three different maps for three different audiences, three different users. And this takes us into an arena that in this field we, th I think, have largely ignored, and yet is enormously important. Once you engage the community, this is the sort of thing that happens. Essentially what we're talking about here is geographic information as a social construction, not as an absolute, not as a scientifically measurable fact, but as a social construction. Something that there's a large literature on, Brian Harley, cartographer at the University of uh, Wisconsin, wrote over many, many years, there's a very nice compendium of his papers called The New Nature of Maps. In the view that we've always held for the last few centuries, which I'll call the modernist view, there's no dispute about what something's called, 909 West Campus Lane. There's no dispute about what type of feature it is. It's a house. There's no dispute about where it is. And that's resolved to about three, plus or minus three meters. 